first of all, it's great to have the opportunity to present to you on Fidelity Special Situations PLC. I am extremely disappointed that I can't be there live. Um, I do really appreciate the AGM as an opportunity to really connect with shareholders. So that's disappointing, but circumstances are what they are. So um, here I am presenting to you um, online. A slide that we often show, just really stating the point of, about how the trust is different from many other funds. You know, the core there you'll see is about investing in undervalued companies that can really deliver over, over the long term. And as I've discussed with you in the past, broad things that I focus on, you know, the growth potential for a company, its competitive advantage and how that feeds into returns, particularly returns on capital and free cash flow generation. And then finally, management, really evaluating a company's or a management team's strategy, their ability to execute that strategy and the degree to which they're aligned with us as shareholders. Now, outside of that, you'll see you know, some of the other factors that we highlight. And I guess the key thing that, that is really important for me as the fund manager is the flexibility that these things bring. And bringing all, this, all these things together really, I think, positions us well to capitalize on uh, the investment opportunity in China. So naturally, we have the closed end structure, which means we have less liquidity constraints. We can own smaller cap companies without having to worry too much about flows. We have the ability to gear as well. Um, and I'll talk about how the gearing has changed through this period of, of huge volatility, but having that ability to gear has been very, very valuable in navigating this period of volatility, as has the ability to invest in options and also stock shorts. So that's also something that's definitely supported performance over this period. And then finally, the ability to invest in unlisted companies. So as you'll see there, we have unlisted holdings, just over 5% of total net assets. Again, I'll touch on that, but there's still a great deal of activity in the pre-IPO stage of companies in China. You know, I'm still very much of the belief that it's, it's the long-term performance that matters. And you can see that is there relative to the index. It's also worth noting that we've seen a pickup in, in short-term performance after what had been, I guess, some lackluster performance. I think particularly, you know, having the weight that we do, a significant weight in small caps, clearly has dragged on performance. But it's positive to see that, you know, the market is recognizing the fundamentals of some of these companies. That's come through in performance. And you'll note that over 12 months, we're comfortably ahead of the index. So now I'd like to move on to uh, some discussion around the investment environment. You won't be surprised that, that COVID-19 has obviously been you know, the biggest factor driving both economies and markets over, over the last six months. So it's important to focus on, 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 how I'm looking at, on how I'm looking at things here. So as I've mentioned, you'll see the, you know, the total number of cases per day. So around 5,000 or so, it obviously varies by day, but I think what's interesting to note here is the makeup. So that's shifted pretty significantly over time. And as you'll note, we're seeing significant cases now over Latin America. You know, the US still has pretty significant cases. Asia, I think it's fair to say in general, they've done a fairly good job of flattening the curve, so to speak. In Asia, I guess we're still seeing increasing cases in places like India and Indonesia, but on the whole, the numbers are, are quite low. And you know, in particularly China, which, you know, despite being very much the epicenter of the virus, we've seen, you know, really very few cases. So I think it's fair to say they've done, you know, a very good job of flattening the curve. We do have, you know, some flare ups, but, you know, I think overall they're pretty insignificant. And what you see is the reaction is swift. So I didn't have, you know, really great concern about second waves in China. And I think if you, you know, really thought on a global basis, you know, it's hard to imagine another country that's really, you know, more prepared for a second wave uh, in terms of their ability to, uh, to deal with it. But, you know, these global trends are still extremely important. Obviously have a, you know, a huge impact on global growth and also, you know, a significant impact on both consumer and corporate sentiment. So overall, you know, my view is that we are getting on top of this, but really, you know, the key to reopening here is key. We've seen a great global monetary and fiscal response. You know, we're coming from a very low base. You know, economies have, have really fallen uh, significantly. So that trajectory of recovery is definitely very important and something that we continue to watch quite closely. It is hard to measure, but I think it's actually pretty difficult to make a bet on a significant recovery from here. I think it's going to be a, a slower recovery and definitely very bumpy along the way. Finally, on this point around the virus, um, I, I, I did want to reassure you that we're spending a lot of time um, on, on you know, 
really analyzing how the world will be different coming out of this. I think some things are, are definitely clear. Um, you know, I, I do think the shift online that we've seen will accelerate, uh, whether that's in e-commerce, in education, gaming, etc. You know, we estimate that that over forty percent of the trust is actually invested in companies that are actually beneficiaries of of of, of this shift. I've talked about you know the trajectory of recovery being important. And you can see how China is recovering here. And these are some charts that try to aggregate a number of factors in coming up with sort of an aggregate measure of how far back we are. So on an aggregate basis, you can, basis you can see, you know, with the, with the red bar graph there that we're basically sort of back to 90% or so. Again, it does very, very much by sector. Our sense is that manufacturing is very much back. So, you know, most of the companies that we're talking to are pretty much back to full utilization. On the consumer side, it's actually quite varied. For example, in the auto space, which as we know, has, had been you know, fairly weak, even you know, heading into the virus, we've actually seen things coming back pretty swiftly. Especially in the premium sector, we're seeing things come back quite strongly. In areas like retail, it very much varies. For some companies, you know, they're back to sort of, you know, in terms of same store sales, back to growth. Examples being some of the sportswear companies. But if you look at retail sales overall, I think, you know, for April, we were down about 7% and May just under 3%. So again, the recovery is there, but we sort of need to, you know, to really watch how, how things recover overall. And again, that's what we're doing, you know, and speaking to companies on a, on a daily basis. I will say, you know, and not surprisingly, in the service sector, you know, the, re- the recovery has been slower. Again, very few restaurants and hotels, etc., are back to being where they were. Most of them we're finding are down probably, you know, 10 to 30%. But you know, again, the, you know, things, are, things are, are, are definitely recovering. You know, your purchase manager index is, a, I think, a good indication of corporate sentiment. And I think it's encouraging that you're seeing you know, the recovery that we're seeing there in red in China. So the most recent numbers in both manufacturing and non-manufacturing above 50 and improving. And as you can see in that chart, you know, looking pretty positive relative to other economies. So we'll hope that that can continue. We've tabled some of the measures that we're seeing coming out of China in the form of stimulus, both on the monetary side and the fiscal side. I think these are clearly significant, perhaps not as significant as some of the measures that we've seen announced out of other countries globally. But, you know, I think clearly the the commitment is there and we'll see more and more of the implementation of these strategies going forward. So on the monetary side, potentially interest rate cuts, definitely, I think we'll see more triple R cuts. On the fiscal side, you know, that will clearly come through. I think we've seen pretty significant fundraising already, particularly amongst the local governments. And again, I expect to see, you know, that investment to play out really in the coming months. We've also seen a pretty significant pickup in credit growth. So clearly the banks have been encouraged to support companies, particularly, you know, small and and mid-sized enterprises. It's important to see how the funding or debt that's been raised, how it's actually spent. But I would note, obviously, as I showed on the previous slide, the pickup in PMI is is a good indicator that you know that capital we put to work in the economy. Moving on to you know the next challenge, which is uh, you know U.S.-China trade. You know I won't get really into into the broader relationship here, but I think as I've expressed you know in the past, the friction between the U.S. and China I think is something that will be with us really for decades. Um, and as an investor, it's something that you need to watch and be aware of the impact they can have on, on the companies that we're, we're investing in. What gives me, I guess, some comfort um, is that, you know, the market's comfort, the market's comfort in a way. I mean, the, market, the degree to which the market is becoming, I guess, more comfortable in understanding um, the, the nature of that relationship. Um, and as I present today, um, you know, this has been a week where there's been some pretty significant barbs, I think, from both sides. You know, we've had some, you know, some sanctions announced uh, from the U.S. side um, and China stocks have had the best week they've had really in, in, in some time. So perhaps, you know, the market is, I think, becoming more comfortable with, with um, you know, the, the, the nature of, of, of that relationship. I would hope that, you know, in the market, you know, what's being reflected here is an understanding that, that many of the companies in the market and definitely, you know, the vast majority of companies that we invest in are largely indifferent to, uh, to, to what's going on here. 
Having said all that, coming back to the slide here, which is very much focused on phase one of the trade deal, the good news here is that we're hearing that things are on track. Both sides have uh, very much reiterated their phase one commitments. And we've actually seen some, some positive moves from the Chinese side in enforcing areas like IP and opening markets, albeit that's come mostly in the financial space. Just to reiterate the point about where the trust is invested. So, you know, the vast majority of revenues, when we aggregate all the revenues of the companies that we're investing in, are invested in, in Greater China. The rest of world proportion has increased slightly through the sell-off that we've seen. We've seen some more global companies really sold off significantly and unfairly in my view. And that's presented opportunities for, for good companies that I followed for some time that do have more of a global business. You know, there's been opportunities to invest in some of those companies. And thus you see that reflected in a greater rest of world exposure. But at the same time, the vast majority of the trust is very much focused on the domestic opportunity in China. I touched earlier on, on the way that the financial markets in, uh, in China are opening up. You know, the development and deepening of the financial markets um, you know, continues. We've got a slide here looking at the global IPOs in 2019. And you see that of the top 10 markets by IPO and value, five of them are in China. I think it's fair to say the, you know, the, the star market in Shanghai has, has clearly been a success. I think that's been recognized and you're seeing some of the same principles behind that being implemented now in Shenzhen. Foreign and institutional ownership of the market continues to grow. I think looks set to continue both in equities and in fixed income. On the next slide, we're showing really how valuations are looking now in China. And as you know, we're looking at this relative to the US, price to earnings and price to book. You know, I've obviously seen an extremely volatile time in markets. We've seen a, a sharp sell-off uh, and then a rebound. And as a result of that, you know, I just want to give, I guess, a warning note on the, uh, the price to earnings chart there. You know, this is 12 months you know, forward price to earnings. And obviously we've got earnings being impacted pretty significantly this year. So that obviously has the potential to depress earnings and increase the price to earnings ratio. And so perhaps price to book is a better indication there as you see on the right. But in any case, we see you know, still a significant discount in Chinese shares versus the US for what is in many cases, I think better growth prospects. Following on from that, just looking at how small caps have really lagged the, you know, the large caps over the past 38 months. And that underperformance has really been driven you know, a lot more by multiple. As you see there on the chart on the right, we're looking at the large cap multiple relative to small cap. We're sort of very, very much at extremes. And as you know, the trust does have you know, a significant exposure to small caps. Uh, over 50% of the trust is below 5 billion US in, in market cap versus the benchmark probably being at around 10%. So this has clearly been a drag on performance. As I discussed, you know, sort of in the opening discussion, I really go where I see the opportunity and that's where I'm seeing the opportunity now. It's, it's hard to know when you see, you know, that, that sort of, you know, the valuation discrepancy close, but I do think there's good potential for, for that to close over time. As long as the companies can execute, I am a believer in efficient markets. And so, you know, I, I think you know, there's good potential for, for some of the small caps to be recognized. And I do think, as I was saying earlier about the development of the capital markets, that will support that process. The flexibility to adjust this gearing is really a great asset, particularly during, you know, a period of great volatility that, that we've just seen. And you know, this is a longer term chart, but you know, if we look at the more recent trends, you'll notice how you know, the, the net gearing really came down significantly in March. And just to explain that, in the early days of the virus, when I think things were very unclear, I you know, was taking some money off you know, the longs that we had in the portfolio and actually added you know, some protection in the portfolio in the form of, of index put options. As the market fell, the value of those options increased, which has brought down net gearing. As those are in the money, I closed the majority of those. And it was also a time when I was finding a lot more opportunity on the long side, given you know, the pretty significant sell-offs that we'd seen. You know, it was a period of great volatility and uncertainty, but you know, it was becoming clearer to me that many stocks were sold off unfairly. So that was the chance to, to add to those. Thus, you see the pickup in net gearing. And also, I should add that we added Pony Eye in the unlisted portfolio as well, which obviously contributed to an increase in net gearing as well. As I said at the at the outset, actual you know the net gearing is down a little bit from where we're showing on this chart. We're down at, at sort of you know the 20% level or so. So on this chart, we're looking at the share price discount to NAV. We're still very much in the process of closing that discount. 
it may look like we've stalled somewhat in recent months. I actually don't think that's you know a, really a bad result, given really what we've been through, you know, both economically, economically and in the markets. And I do believe that over time, as we show that we can continue to grow the NAV through difficult periods like we're going through, that that should be reflected in NAV growth. And again, you know, hopefully that supports the closing of that discount over time. Okay, so now we're going to delve a little bit deeper into you know, some actual holdings into the portfolio. But what we started with here is a chart on what we're saying is the middle class consumer. So obviously, this is a key focus of the trust. As you know, the development of the middle class is a key theme that really runs through the portfolio. And what we're showing here is the results of internal survey that we've run. Really just, I guess, trying to get into the mindset and understand you know, how consumption decisions are being made. So on the chart there on the left, you can see around the question of sort of shopping in general in terms of the areas of focus. And you can see how quality is just a, you know, a really significant focus. And I think that's an area that's clearly becoming more important. When it comes to the actual purchase decision, you know, there could be more of a focus on price, but I do think you know, the focus that we see there on quality is clearly growing. And it's something that we also sense in talking to companies on a daily basis. I think also interesting is you know, the chart on the right. And this is asking really about house decoration. But you can see the, you know, the importance of using green materials. So I think you know, that environmental awareness is clearly picking up and impacting purchase decisions as well. So this slide is showing some trends you know, specifically within the auto sector. I did mention how the recovery that we'd seen, you know, autos is an area that's, you know, that's sort of back in positive territory. I think what's interesting, as you see on both these charts, you know, the red is showing the more premium sector. So basically cars above that 250,000 RMB level and how, I guess, one, you know, the way they continue to grow as a proportion of overall mix, but also how the recovery has clearly been fastest in that sector, which feeds well into the next slide. You know, I think we may have presented this company in the past, but China Meidong Auto is definitely one of the core holdings in the portfolio. They are an auto dealer focused on premium brands, very much focused in the South, but expanding. And I do like this example because it fits, I think, pretty well within the framework that I talked about. So, you know, the growth element is there. You know, here's a company with you know, around 60 or so dealerships, which may sound like a lot, but it's not that much in a China context. There's lots of room for growth and they will grow faster, partly as a result of you know, being focused on premium. You've got the likes of Lexus, Porsche, BMW as, as sort of core brands. You know, I think there's good potential for them to occupy a bigger space of the overall market. Also from a returns perspective, you know, I think they will, will definitely improve over time as the service portion of revenues grows for the company. And then finally, management. We're talking about a team with a proven ability to execute you know, both organically and also with, with M&A. They've shown that they can buy and they can integrate. So that can provide, I think, another potential boost for growth over time. The next company is the 21 Vnet Group. This is an independent data center operator in China. I spoke earlier about the trends that we're seeing as a result of COVID, you know, really an acceleration of that trend online. This is really creating just an explosion in data and that data needs to be managed. 21 Vnet is you know, squarely positioned in a position to benefit from that. The company still, although it's done well, trades at a, a pretty significant discount to peers. Part of which I think was deserved in the past, but now they're you know, clearly closing the gap, particularly as they grow in the wholesale segment, supporting the likes of Alibaba as they expand. When we talk about innovation in China, many people just think um, of, of, of the tech space, but there's a huge amount of innovation in the healthcare space also. And we see that, as you see in this chart, it's coming through in really significant growth in the R&D spend of companies. And you know, when we speak to experts, many of them think that it's a matter of time before we have some truly novel drugs with real global potential coming out of China. So Wuxi Aptech is, you know, I think a company that will clearly benefit from that increased R&D spend that we talked about, particularly the increased focus on innovative drugs. And you can see on this chart on the right how that R&D spend is feeding into growth in the total CRO market in China. So they're well positioned to benefit from that. They're the you know, clear market leader in China, but you know, these, they're really a global player. They have a global roster of pharmaceutical companies and they get global pricing. And supporting this is just a really a strong talent pool in China that they've shown a strong ability to recruit and retain over time. And the growth potential is clearly there as you can see, but it's also coming on the back of them expanding the types of services that they can provide these pharmaceutical companies. 
Yadi is the largest electric scooter manufacturer in China. We discovered the stock early on when the share price was still very depressed. After extensive due diligence, we realized Yadi has a good brand and is led by a strong management team. The company has been gaining market share consistently in the last 10 years and is now a clear industry leader. Last year, a key regulatory change to improve safety standard will have a significant impact on the industry. First, we will have a big replacement demand as older electric scooters are forced to phase out. Second, industry consolidation will accelerate because smaller players are no longer competitive. As an industry leader, Yadi will be a key beneficiary of the regulatory change. We expect companies' volume to more than double and margin to expand significantly in the next five years, which means profitability will dramatically increase. Yadi has also benefited from COVID-19 this year because more and more people are using electric scooters to avoid crowded public transportation. As a result, share price has nearly tripled. However, even at this share price, we believe market still underestimates the medium-term earning potential for the company, and there's still substantial upside left in the stock. Alibaba is the largest e-commerce platform in China. In the last 12 months, more than 700 million people each spent 1,200 US dollars on average on Alibaba's platform. E-commerce is now about low 20s of retail sales in China and continues to rise, driven by the broad product offering, competitive pricing, and convenient delivery services. COVID-19 has further accelerated the e-commerce penetration, especially for those categories with relatively lower online presence, such as luxury and grocery. Alibaba is not just about e-commerce. Over the years, they have been pushing the boundaries and have achieved leading positions in many other fields. For example, they are the largest cloud player in China with over 40% market share. They are also the mobile payment leader in China. The payment app Alipay has become a super app whereby consumers can do shopping, pay utilities, order food delivery, book tickets, and even purchase mutual funds, etc. As consumers stay longer in Alibaba's ecosystem, they leave more data about themselves. From those data, Alibaba generates valuable customer insights, which they use to help merchants provide the right products with the right pricing and at the right time. Alibaba's current monetization rate is just one third of what their Western peers charge. As they add more value to merchants, the monetization will rise. In conclusion, we believe Alibaba is a long-term winner. It has a very strong positioning in the structurally growing e-commerce industry and offers tremendous option value in other areas. Tencent is the social network monopoly in China with 1.2 billion active users on the WeChat app. The user base is an extremely deep mode. The strong network effect is very difficult to break when your family, friends, and coworkers are all on the same network. Tencent has been monetizing their user base through online entertainment, advertising, fintech, as well as business services. Talking about online entertainment, Tencent is the largest video game publisher globally and also the largest music and the video streaming player in China. COVID-19 is bringing an expansion of audience for interactive online entertainment because the prolonged social distancing make people have less chance to meet offline like before. In advertising, Tencent has low teens market share in China, which has good room to grow given they have over 40% share of the online time spent by Chinese. Tencent's social network-based advertising property is very unique and personalized, while the monetization is only one-third of the Western peers, such as Facebook. In other areas, Tencent is among the top players in payment and cloud, which have been new growth drivers for Tencent. Overall, we like Tencent's monopoly position in social network. We believe it has huge monetization potential driven by the highly sticky user base and strong ecosystem. So, you know, finally, we have a slide here just on our unlisted holdings. As I mentioned earlier, I'm quite optimistic, really, on the potential for all these companies. Some of them have clearly been impacted by the virus. Not surprisingly, Didi is the leader in, in ride sharing in China has clearly been impacted. But, you know, these guys are, are also clearly, you know, on the, on the path to recovery as well. Sense time, still the clear leader in AI. 
ByteDance continues to do extremely well, both in China with you know the Douyin brand and TikTok overseas. So you know that's the one that continues to grow strongly and has shown you know an ability to to take significant market share of online advertising in China. And then Pony Eye, the most recent addition you know to the unlisted portfolio which I think is very well positioned to be the market leader in uh, autonomous driving um, in China. So, you know, ESG is really a key part of our investment process. I think, you know, definitely on the governance side, it's always been, you know, a core part of the process, part of that management tenant that I spoke about at the, uh, at the outset. But, you know, now really ESG overall is, is a core part of the process. And it really goes down to the analyst level. The analysts are, uh, you know, now have ratings, ESG ratings on, on all the companies that they look at. In addition to that, we have an engagement team that you know, can engage with companies separately on specific areas. So, you know, I think obviously, as well as being the right thing for society, this can be you know, a really important driver for stocks over time as well. We do find that a lot of the standard ratings that are out there for ESG are stale, particularly in China. So where, you know, the degree to which we can have a different view, particularly where companies are improving significantly, you know, that can be, you know, I think a significant share price driver or potentially be a share price driver over the midterm. So now we're showing the sector positioning. As we've said here, it remains very much focused on new China and concentrated in those sectors, you know, with consumer related close to 50 percent IT, but also communication services, which includes Tencent, more about Tencent as opposed to, you know, the big the big telco operators and then healthcare. You know, there are some changes. There's been an increase in financials, still no banks. I still don't think you know, the risk reward still really adds up there. Quite significant holdings in insurance, which have been major underperformers and still look very cheap to me relative to you know, the long-term prospects, particularly in your sort of you know, more traditional protection type life products still looks really significant. Additionally, you know, increased exposure in wealth management through the likes of NOAA and also consumer finance, which to me looks more interesting now with you know, the re- regulatory landscape becoming more clear. And finally, on the key holdings in the portfolio, you see the, the top holdings on the left and the active holdings, i.e. relative to benchmark on the right. As you will see, you know, Tencent and Alibaba are still you know, very core positions in the portfolio. You know, for me, their position, you know, in the in the Chinese economy, you know, really just grows stronger, and the monetization potential of those positions is really significant. Obviously, you know, you've got their core businesses, and the likes of e-commerce and gaming, but you know, these are really conglomerates, and there's significant value elsewhere in the portfolio, and I think particularly in financial services, where they've continued to grow, grow strongly, in fact, and have actually pretty well navigated again what's been a pretty difficult, difficult period. But, you know, there's other significant areas of their portfolios. You've got to look at areas like cloud, you know, which China is, sort of lags the West, but is growing significantly as well. So these can be significant value drivers, you know, for these companies as well. So, you know, when we do our sum of the parts, they still offer, offer significant value, maybe not as much value as I see in some of the other holdings. And thus, you know, that gets reflected in sort of underweight positions, but nevertheless, you know, really core holdings um, in the portfolio.